uh, we begin our next session with Axel Thielmann. Axel Thielmann is a manufacturer based out of Hamburg and is a part of the Hacker Fulfill team, which develops computer games. And uh, today, he is going to be talking about Hacker Fulfill, which is a game that was developed in, uh, during, before the uh, 33C3. And he would be talking about the updates and uh, the new features that the game has. Over to you. Okay. Uh, can we have a round of applause to, uh, for the speaker? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Axel. I'm uh, from Hackerfuffel. We're a small indie game label from uh, Hamburg. And uh, over the last half year, we built a mobile game console, or started building one, and we'd like to show you. Um, yeah, well, like, um, we're a bunch of uh, retro developers. Um, three people are involved in the team. Um, there is uh, um, Rick, who unfortunately couldn't come today, but he does uh, um, the main development environment um, coding. There is Christoph, who is sitting. Where is he sitting? Oh, he's sitting in the back, um, who does all the, the graphics and design aspects, and who also created this great presentation so you don't have to suffer through LaTeX slides uh, built by me. Um, and uh, um, yeah, um, I'm Axel, and I do mostly the, the hardware development and low-level coding. Um, yeah, we've, we've done a, um, a couple of releases, mostly retro games. Um, you can see them on our website. Uh, they're all um, available for download. Some of them you can even play online. And um, um, this is uh, Puzzle Cave, for example. And I think uh, it's, um, that's uh, Fufflebuy on the right. Yeah, we, we all grew up with, uh, in the 80s with 80s hardware, some of us this with um, home computers, some of us with game consoles, and uh, we, we always loved these systems. And of course, mobile games were around at that time, but they weren't really that great. Um, they were kind of clunky, really bad battery life, they were very expensive, um, you couldn't get many games, and sometimes if you wanted one, you actually had to order one from Japan. Um, so I never really had a, had a mobile game system. This might also be because there wasn't a mobile C64, but yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, well, um, fast forward 30 years later, um, so much has changed. Like electronics has changed a lot. Um, so much um, interesting stuff coming with the, with the Internet of Things and, and small electronics now. Um, the maker scene has, an, has evolved and suddenly you have, have access to uh, really professional manufacturing for, for DIY products or, or projects. Um, and uh, of course, maker, maker spaces have happened. And suddenly, uh, you can just go to your friendly um, neighborhood maker space and use a laser cut or a 3D printer. So um, you can, these days, you can do um, projects that were completely impractical and really expensive just 10 years ago. Um, and also, retro gaming is, is really booming. There's lots of DIY projects out there, um, all kinds of things, people building their own systems. There's a bunch of, of uh, crowdfunding um, campaigns out there who really like, get really big funding. And, and even all the, the, the old big companies like Nintendo and Sega and Atari are coming back and re-releasing um, some of the old systems. And they're really well received for the, for the Nintendo systems. They usually sold out before they're, they're even on the market. Yeah, well, at the, at the end of last year, we sat at the Attractor Makerspace, and well, we, we kind of just started talking about all these, these systems coming out and what we liked about them. And uh, well, many martyrs later, uh, long story short, we decided, hey, let's, let's build our own. Let's build the, the mobile game console that we always wanted and, and never had. And we kept talking and kept talking. And yeah, another few hours later, we had all these, all these design sketches. Um, some are more serious than others. Um, I, I really like the, the multiplayer ones. Um, and there's also, that's one of my favorites, um, where you uh, connect your, uh, your game console to your mobile phone over, a, over an audio cable and uh, can maybe just download games from the audio track of a YouTube video like you did with audio tapes um, back in the 80s. Um, yeah, so we, we had a lot of crazy ideas. And we're, we're pr pretty hooked on the thing. But what did we want to build? Um, yeah, we wanted to build a mobile game system. 
um, but on, on really more uh, modern hardware. Just really see where, where, where the, what, what we loved about these systems, where this could be in, uh, yeah, well, 2017. Um, we wanted to add lots of sensors that maybe have never been tried on a, on a game system. Uh, I, I really love sensors. I'm a hardware guy, so uh, this is kind of my thing. Um, and we wanted to build it as, as completely open hardware and open source. So um, building a system like that in, uh, in mass production is really quite complex or, or difficult. So what we went with, what we wanted to make a spaceable design, um, basically saying if you have the PCB and you have a little bit of soldering experience, you can just go to your makerspace and the design will be done in a way that you can just um, um, use a laser cutter or a 3D printer and after a weekend or so, you have your own system. But this would also um, uh, um, enable people to, to remix the system. If you have access to all the design files, all the stack down, um, all, the, all the developers, everybody um, who has access to that can also build the, the console they always wanted. Or maybe, maybe just change some little thing that always bugged them about it. But most of all... Um, hello? Most of all, we wanted a true retro system. Um, I've been saying this word quite a lot. What does it actually mean? For, for us, retro was a lot more than just like games with big pixels and flashy colors. Um, and sometimes there's even a flash game behind it. So now nah, this, this is not what we wanted. And also, retro games usually focus on, on the player, on the, on the experience the player had, and, and typical game mechanics, um, and a certain aesthetics. But um, in the 80s, owning a computer was also being a developer, coding for this. This was right in the manual. The C64 manual starts and really uh, immediately tells you how to do low-level programming. Um, and there was a whole development side to, to retro gaming that, that we were interested in and that we wanted to keep alive. Because the, the old hardware system slowly but steadily die, um, they, or they just get put in a museum where you can't code on them. And all the old developers, well, they don't, don't really die, but they move on to other things. Um, and so there's, there's a whole developer community and, um, yeah, that, we, that we wanted to, to help build forward and, and yeah, see where this is going. So what, what's retro for coders? Um, for us, it was like simple, simple interfaces, simple graphics functionality um, that you can get into easily. Um, Small dev teams, like in the 80s, when, when computer games were usually done by one to maybe three person, um, and we wanted to have a, have a manageable, manageable project size. So not like today, when you have tens or hundreds of people working on a big game. So what we were aiming at was kind of a one developer, one weekend kind of thing. If you, if you had an idea for a game that you could start and yeah, finish, finish within time. And um, one of the uh, really important things for us in, in retro was, was uh, restricting complexity. And um, back in the 80s, uh, all these systems were really, really restricted. But that's, that was not a, a conscious design decision, at least, at least not for, for the game. It was a restriction because of financial reasons or practical reasons. Um, this was consumer electronics, usually aimed at kids. And you had to be able to buy the whole thing for maybe a few hundred dollars. Um, so these, these systems were really, really um, restricted, but yeah, purely for, for financial reasons. Um, but this also, this, this kind of restriction became um, sort of the, the identity of these, these old systems. Um, and it also led to a sort of recognizable aesthetics for, for each of those platforms. For, me, for some of the platforms, um, you can see a screenshot, and you don't know what game is it, but you can tell from the, from the screenshot which platform this is, simply because that's the, that's the graphics engine of this and this system. Um, to, to give you a little more of a shard metaphor for us, like we felt retro gaming was like going camping. Because for, for, for camping, you just get your stuff, start at point A, go out into nature and enjoy that. And you accept that the temporary discomfort of sleeping in a sleeping bag in a, in a, in a tent. Um, but you really, like, you're out enjoying this, and it's not really about getting to point B. Um, 
and uh, the, the gear you did that you take, um, tent, stove, backpack, uh, when this was invented, this was also not invented for fun. It was invented so people had shelter and food and like, could gave, get from A to B. And, and these days, um, camping is a, lot, is a lot nicer, a lot, lot more technology in this. We have self-pitching tents, um, all kinds of high-tech materials. And before you know it, you're on a, on a camp with, uh, with uh, thousands of strangers and, and power and ethernet in your tent. So the, the experience has been cleaned up a little bit. And this is, this is sort of what we wanted to do with, with retro development. We wanted to keep the core alive, but slowly try to clean it up and, and try to remove the things that were just annoying. Um, for example, weird hardware behavior that was just there because the graphics chip needed some data, like it was on the, on the C64. Um, we also wanted easier interfaces um, and offer a bunch of modules that especially uh, newcomers could use um, and that would sort of uh, enable to use a, a certain uh, development technique um, rather than having to develop everything your own. And we removed assembler. So, uh, of course, all these old systems, they used assembler coding and you, you had to learn that. And Removing this is a bit of a contradiction, but we felt, yeah, that maybe this, this would put the learning curve a little bit too high. And what we also wanted, uh, we wanted the system to be inviting to play around with. And this meant uh, choosing the right level of complexity. And we wanted to do this on, on hardware, for software, um, and for graphics. For graphics, this means um, low resolution, fewer colors. Um, because even, even for a pro designer, if you have to pixel uh, something that's, that's thousands of pixels um, per side, um, that's quite a lot of work, and this, this can put you off, um, especially for a, for a hobby project, um, or it, it, you will just never finish it and, and toss it aside, and yeah, so you would never get your game finished. For the software, it meant uh, having a modular OS, but also restricting the, the number of modules, the number of interfaces, and, and make the, the system a little bit easier to learn. So, um, and, and, and also for, for, the, for the whole design, we want it to be not so uniform and polished and like perfect, um, because this might intimidate people uh, who are really just, just learning about this. We want it a little bit to be a little bit rough. Um, so, yeah, the, the people can just take it and do whatever they want with it. So we wanted to have a, have a good number of parts um, on all these levels. Um, and uh, once you have that, something interesting happens. If you restrict the complexity, um, the newcomers will, will um, find it easier to, to start with the system, and uh, the, the people who are more advanced will really see this as a challenge. How can I, what can I do with this, How, with this within this restriction, within these rules? This is kind of like, like board games, like chess. Um, these games have been around for, for literally thousands of years, um, and uh, people are still uh, di discovering new things, and as these, these, these board games really become a, a place of, of competition, or, or um, um, yeah, just, just comparing what you can do with this. And for the C64, for example, it, uh, now it's almost 40 years um, since it's been out, and people are still discovering new things and really still improving graphics. Um, so this is what you get for the pros if you restrict complexity. Yeah, but on to a few more specific goals that we want to have. We didn't want it don't to clone, edit, like, um, directly clone anything. Um, no emulators, no uh, big OS below us. Um, just the game OS on, on hardware. We want to complete do, completely uh, do new hardware and software, um, co-developed an iteration so we could figure out what would work and, and what didn't. Um, we wanted a small, uh, low-resolution screen, and we couldn't really uh, agree on, on the type of system or the era of the system that we wanted to, to uh, base this upon. And, and again, this was a good thing. Um, because now it's a bit of this and a bit of that, and it's, yeah, it, it has to be recombinable. So we settled on, um, on a TFT of about three inches um, to, a, to a 40 by 160 resolution, 
Um, 16 fixed colors, meaning you could guess just these 16 colors. Um, you can't change them in any way. Um, plus one color, which is transparency. Um, we want a true 60 hertz uh, screen refresh rate, so nice, smooth scrolling, nothing jerky, like it was on the again on the C64. Um, for controls, we settled for the usual D-pad and, and buttons uh, combination for now. Um, well, this is tried and true, and people intuitively know uh, what, um, how to use it. And for graphics functionality, the starting set was two modules. One was, the, uh, was a tile engine with 8x8 uh, pixels, and the other one was a sprite engine um, with 32x32 uh, 32 32 pixels. Yeah, so a tile engine. Um, this, this is probably one of the most iconic um, graphics techniques that came out of these old systems, and it's, it's really quite simple. Um, you start with, uh, with a, what's called a tile sheet, which is just a bunch of, of small rectangular graphics, um, like here, and then you sort of stamp them together to form a larger graphics. And if you do it in, in, in this top-down manner, you get this really, uh, this, this sort of uh, checkerboard structure and uh, uh, yeah, a lot of similarity, and you get a, get a very recognizable aesthetics. Um, on the other hand, um, if you do it um, bottom-up, which, uh, as far as I know, was done for Maniac Manson, um, they started with full-drawn pictures and then had a, had a program figure out what the optimal um, tile set would be and just calculated that and uh, put, um, put that on the, into the game. And there you can see that this is, this is really mainly an efficiency technique because it saves a lot of time um, copying stuff uh, between places and RAM, which you don't really have on a, on a low power system. Um, it saves RAM and it saves floppy. A, a game like Maniac Manson would not have fit on the, on the few uh, floppy sides that it was um, if this, this were really um, bitmaps. Oh, it's back. Um, the other one is sprites, and for sprites, um, that's even more just, just an optimization technique. Um, the, the graphics chip will allow you to program small rectangular pieces of graphics, um, and you can just program a register where you want that sprite to be, and it will take a care of uh, handling the transparency, because it's not rectangular, um, blend it with the, with, the, with the background, and once you move it, remove it from there and put it somewhere else. And a sprite engine would usually also um, handle collision with other sprites or with a background, um, so you know when yeah, well, you might be hit um, by a projectile or uh, touching a monster or something. And uh, again, th you can all do all, um, all this in software. There's really no reason other than performance um, to do it in hardware. Ah, OK. So, um, building hardware. What it's, what, what's the basic structure? Um, most of these old systems have a sort of r not very remarkable CPU usually. Um, usually um, they, they, these were uh, selected for price. And the, the heart, the identity of, of systems like that was really in the, in the graphics chip. And if you really build a game console, what all these companies did was uh, they developed a specialized IC. Um, and then attached it over to an exposed system bus to the, to the CPU, and so the CPU could just write uh, or had the, had the interface to the graphics chip in main memory, and uh, it was easy from a program to just you, you write to a specific memory location, and stuff would happen for the graphics engine. Um, yeah, this, this, of course, only will work if you already know that, that you um, will sell a few millions of units, so this was kind of ruled out for us. Um, there's another way uh, to use uh, reconfigurable hardware like FPGAs, where you can really build your own graphics chip, um, but this would have made the, the hardware really expensive um, to be, because FPGAs are quite expensive, and also they are sort of hard to develop for, and it takes a long time, um, and we wanted to iterate quickly to, to try out concepts. So what is left is uh, basically doing everything in software, which is a bit boring, or uh, go look for a microcontroller that has modern graphics functionality and see if we can use this. Yeah, and this was about half a year ago at the CCC Congress in uh, Hamburg. And um, yeah, we, we 
just, just wanted to start building, so we selected this, um, something would, that would roughly fit. Um, we wanted a very, very fast microcontroller, so we had enough uh, um, compute power to do whatever we wanted to try out. We wanted, to, um, wanted support for um, good low-level graphics and a TFT interface. And uh, this is what we went for. Um, that's um, a board uh, with an STM32F7, which is one of the fastest microcontrollers that ST makes. Um, and they sell these in these very nice, uh, they're called Nucleo boards. Um, they are really well engineered, have lots of lots of interfaces, and they're really, really cheap. The, the cheapest ones um, are about 10 euros, the biggest ones are about 30 euros. And um, yeah, these are nice to develop with because um, if you put them to the side, you almost have the, the, the form factor like you would need for a, for a mobile game system. And it has a, has a connector here, so we thought, yeah, well, for the first prototype, let's just put another PCB on top of it with controls and a screen, and we're good to go. And the, the microcontroller on it is, is very powerful. It has, uh, it's, it's around 200 megahertz, um, half a megabyte of RAM, two megabytes of flash. Um, and uh, it has a lot of interesting peripherals um, looking at the, at the documentation. Um, so we wanted to try these out. And um, uh, the first peripheral is called um, DMA2D. Um, and DMA2D is really just dedicated circuitry to copy bits, like rectangular bits of, of graphics between um, parts and memory. And you can do this either, uh, like in the top line, just, just copy graphics data from some place to some place else. Um, or you can do it, it um, with, with online conversion. And if you do it like this, the, the source memory really is just a, um, an index into a color lookup table. And uh, the, the DMA to D circuitry will automatically convert this um, into uh, the actual uh, graphics data. Um, and, and it can also handle transparency and, and format conversion and all kinds of stuff. And it's really fast. Um, we did a, did a, um, um, a speed check uh, like at the camp a few days ago, and it turned out we could do like 240,000 copies per second. So yeah, that's very powerful. We thought, okay, we're probably good with this. Let, let's just uh, use this. And. Um, yeah, well, the, the, the rectangular um, screen parts, I think this was mainly meant for having windowing systems, so the, your rectangles would be windows or icons moving around. But hey, we, we just wanted rectangles, we wanted a tile engine. This is a perfect match, and it's, it will also uh, give us the, um, the palette indexing in hardware for free. So this was a really good fit. Um, and the second um, peripheral that's really nice um, was um, the LTDC, which means um, LCD TFT display controller. And it's, it's really just a, just a regular uh, graphics controller to, to attach a TFT, but it's integrated into the microcontroller. And this means that the timing is synchronous, meaning the display controller runs synchronous to the main CPU, and the CPU can know exactly how many cycles have passed um, what the display controller is doing, and like um, it was in a, with the Atari 2600, the, the proverbial racing the beam, you get something like this um, directly, um, if, if it's directly integrated. So we had this, this nice timing, timing integration, and this would allow you to um, use a bunch of techniques um, that, uh, that, that the old systems had, for example, um, updating the picture when you know um, it's currently not anywhere uh, where, the, where the graphics controller is, is drawing. Or you can, can get an interrupt um, at a certain line and switch graphics modes uh, while the screen is drawing and having a different graphics mode uh, for the playing field than, for example, for the menus. So yeah, this was, this was also a great fit. Um, the, the interface is something that's called a raw interface, which means you have to continuously pump out data. If you stop for, for uh, yeah, any time, the, the screen will go white immediately. Um, so uh, things like, uh, screens like that are really just practical if you have an integrated uh, display controller and you have uh, 24 data lines, which is just um, RGB 8-bit um, color. Um, synchronization, two lines for horizontal and vertical, uh, and a clock. And this run at around uh, 10 megahertz. Ah, okay. So, um, yeah, next thing we needed was a screen. 
And like I said, for, to use the LTDC, we needed uh, this raw interface, not something um, with an integrated display controller. And it turns out um, s buying screens or, or sourcing screens is really kind of a pain in the ass. Um, first of all, people are pretty spoiled by mobile phones. They expect really nice screens, high DPIs, very nice colors. Um, and for most non-trivial products, um, screens are, are, uh, are custom-made, so you cannot buy them. There is a, there's a lot of uh, generic screens out there, but they are not very nice. And they're usually um, uh, targeted towards a very specific product. And all the small screens, they were made for um, initially for uh, small mobile phones, for very low power mobile phones. And since mobile phones um, are very low power and uh, don't have a display controller, all these small screens had a display controller integrated but didn't offer uh, the raw interface. So this kind of, um, um, yeah, this, we, we, we couldn't use the, the really small screens, so we, we had to compromise a bit. Um, but in the end, we found something for, for the, um, the, yeah, we bought something that just was available and reasonably well documented, meaning in English and not Chinese. Um, and we could just work with it and, yeah, then, then see. Yeah, so we started prototyping at the, at the Congress in, in Hamburg, and it was really just about uh, testing the LCD interface. Um, this is the setup we had at the Congress. So it's really just a, like a bunch of cables um, attached to the screen. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it took us almost three days until we had the whole, whole software set up running. But in the end, uh, we had this. The graphics engine was running. And we're pretty happy about this. So um, we started building the, the OS structure. And, and overall, well, at the end of the Congress, we knew, OK, this hardware plot frame was going to work. We can do build a prototype based on this. And um, this is what the, what the first prototype looks like, at least half of it, um, because, like I said, it's a, it's a shield uh, that goes onto one of those nucleobots. And um, combined, it looks like this. It has a nice height. And um, yeah, it's, it's really, um, it already feels like, like a mobile system. Um, yeah, the, the PCB itself, um, if I turn it around, this is the user-facing side. The, the screen is currently missing, but you have your, your um, D-pad on the left, um, buttons on the right. And uh, here, this, this, is, this is actually not that much interesting circuitry. It's mainly power. It's a charging controller for the battery, so the whole system would already be um, completely mobile. Um, the battery also powers the nuclear board below. Um, we have, uh, yeah, it, it generates three uh, voltages for the, for the TFT controller and the backlight and the system itself. Um, but we, what we already added was a, was a cartridge slot. Uh, this is a repurposed um, uh, SD card slot with a lot of pins, but we really wanted cartridges because the old systems had cartridges. Um, we added a second screen connector, so we thought, oh, maybe it would be awesome to have a screen that only your opponents see when you, when you play against them. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, and a bit of debug circuitry. So, the, um, yeah, we had, the, we had the prototype after three months or so. It was uh, working nicely. And uh, at the same time, we were building um, the, the OS or starting to, to set up the overall structure. Um, and uh, since we figured, OK, there's probably going to be more than one prototype, uh, let's have a, have a hardware abstraction layer at the, um, as low as possible so the, the actual operating system sits on top of that and we can, can compile this for different hardwares. Um, but it also turned out that once you have that and you have the abstraction, you can put the game OS uh, inside your development environment and, um, and maybe have an emulator or something like that. For the, for the game interface, we initially started with C, um, a sort of restricted, um, cleaned up version of C, um, meaning no libc. And you would only have access to the functions uh, that, we would, that um, the game OS explicitly um, um, gave you. And um, uh, at least the, 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 the OS wouldn't make you use uh, dynamic memory or pointer arithmetic or things like that. So, um, the, the, the functions were designed in a way that it's easier to, to start with a development environment. But once we had that, we thought, OK, maybe we just want to put a Lua uh, scripting engine on top of this, where you have the, the same functions. 
Um, and you can choose either to go with uh, C or with Lua. You would have the, the same programming model, the same functions. Um, but Lua also um, offers a few nice data types, um, again, to get you coding more quickly. So we had hardware, we had software, and we needed something to look at. And the first thing, of course, is, um, is a palette of colors, because, like I said, we had 16 fixed colors. And um, yeah, I'm a hardware guy, so um, well, uh, these are the colors um, made by, by Christoph, and I hope I can, can reproduce this correctly. Um, the, um, the colors, well, they, uh, they, are, they start with the, with the you need colors, um, for example, for, for grass and for trees and for people walking around, so it would uh, be nice for, for making jump and run games. But also, uh, since it's restricted, you want the colors to be easily mixable and blendable and easily um, to, to arrange them in a way that you go can go from, from light to dark. And um, you can see the darker it gets, the bluer it gets. Um, and so the whole palette is kind of geared towards this, this yeah, the, the, the blending effects that you use um, when, when pixeling data or when, when pixeling images. What we put on top of this, on this, uh, of this 16 um, slot palette, is a 256 um, slot palette called a permutation palette. And this also can only. Um, index uh, these 16 colors, so would, you would have necessarily have doubles. Um, but what this allows you is to change um, the, the index during a game and uh, do all kind of palette effects, like palette rolling, um, um, phasing parts of the image in and out. And this was uh, also a technique that was um, extensively done in the 80s and 90s. Um, there's awesome videos on, on YouTube uh, where, you, where people demonstrate what they could do with a single static image and just modifying, modifying the uh, palette. After we had that, we needed game assets. Game assets being everything that the developer wants to put in the game apart from code, graphics, sound. And until we had uh, our proper tool, um, well, basically, we just defined um, um, a graphics format, which was based on C code, so we could immediately feed this to the compiler. Um, and we just to, uh, took two existing tools. This is um, a tool called Graphics, uh, Graphics 2, um, which is based on Deluxe Paint, a uh, um, famous uh, pixeling tool, a graphics tool. Hey, um, and we just yeah, they're both open source, um, and we uh, just took that, added our safe game. So now we already had a had a tool um, to to create um, tile sheets and just render them out and put them put them in the source tree, and uh, to make maps. This is a tool called Tiled, and uh, this one is so flexible we didn't even have to change it. We could directly um, just just load the load the tile maps into it. Um, just create the maps, save it out. It has a few generic, uh, generic formats. And basically, you just have to put curly braces uh, at the beginning, at the end, and you can immediately feed it to compiler. But yeah, th these were just a, just a quick hack to, to get us going. What we really wanted um, was, a, was an integrated development environment. And um, yeah, this is the, um, the, a screenshot of an early version of the hacker tool. Um, and uh, sort of, this is sort of the command central for, for all the parts of, uh, of the creation process. In the middle, um, you have your source code window. Um, at the top, there's sort of a, no, not, not a full emulator of the system, but uh, there's, um, it, it's a possibility if you have created animation um, to, to try things out or to try out the maps. So it's kind of a, a simulator of parts of the game engine. Um, and uh, on the left is uh, music tracking, and on the right you can uh, pixel tiles and sprites and um, also do animations and see uh, how those work. Yeah, um, this is uh, where, we are, where we currently are. Um, here you also can see why I didn't show you that much uh, footage of the, of the console itself. Um, this is just a camera artifact, so sorry for the flickering. Um, but uh, yeah, after the talk, if you like, you can, can see it on the, on the system directly. Um, but yeah, the tile engine is working. The sprite engine is working. For the tiles, we uh, currently support uh, one layer of tiles. Um, the map can be any size, like big, a lot bigger than the screen. Um, and it will smoothly scroll. 
And in the few, uh, next few months, we wanna, uh, want to add uh, multi-layer tiles um, so, uh, if with uh, zooming, so you can have a sort of a depth, the depth effect, like it's often used in, in jump and run games. That's called parallax scrolling. Um, we want animated tiles, so maybe the grass on your, on your map is automatically uh, moving, or there's a waterfall in the back. Um, yeah, this will be this will uh, be the state of the of the tile engine when it's well not completed, but this is what we're aiming for for the first prototype. Um, yeah, the sprite engine is uh, also moving again at the moment. You can display any number of sprites, so it's not really restricted. Um, we still have to add collision and uh, animation um, for the sprites. So for the, for the second prototype, for the next revision of the hardware, what do we want to add? Um, like I said, we really like the idea of having cartridges. And uh, yeah, this will definitely be part of the, of the second prototype again. Um, it's not really needed because memory is so cheap. You can really just put everything on one flash. But we really like the experience of having one game uh, per cartridge and picking it up, putting it in, and uh, you immediately can start the game and you don't have to scroll through lists and lists and lists of ROM and uh, look uh, at ROM 3825. So this is kind of a you know, player experience thing that we wanted. And, and again, it turns out that uh, modern microcontrollers, you can just attach flash and it will, it will show up in main memory. Um, for this controller, even I think up to six different flash images or, or flash ICs. Um, so we could just put that bus on the on the cartridge connector, and we would uh, really have a have a behavior uh, that's very similar to what what the old systems did in the 80s. Um, we also put um, an extension bus on there um, based on on uh, I square C and SPI. Um, and and for the microcontroller world, if you have these two protocols, you can basically put anything there. These are these are extremely versatile protocols. Um, so again, um, earlier cartridges, it, it was not uncommon for a cartridge not to only supply game code, but also to maybe extend RAM, um, add, a, add a coprocessor, sometimes even re really replace the CPU, and do all kinds of, of, of crazy extensions, because the, the, uh, the cartridge slot usually was just the, the system bus, and the cartridge could do whatever the hell it wanted. Next. Um, that we want to add is uh, networking, right? uh, wireless networking. And we want, for this, we want some kind of um, broadcast medium, similar to Ethernet, basic, basically, um, but no routing, um, and no point-to-point -point coupling, no linking, or anything like this. What we're, what we're aiming for is simply um, all, the, all the Hacker Boy systems that are in, within radio distance of each other um, immediately and automatically see each other, and will, this will show up in, 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 um, in memory, in, in uh, menus, and you say, okay, I, I want to join a game. And this is yeah, sort of like, uh, th think of it like LAN party type network um, of the 90s. And we will probably um, use Bluetooth 5 for this, um, mainly because it's well new and interesting, um, but it also has an extended radio range, um, and it comes with uh, Bluetooth uh, mesh, so you can connect even more systems together. Um, and what you get for free with Bluetooth is a connecting, a connection to, um, to mobile phones, so you can have a companion app and uh, download, download new games and yeah, what have you. Um, maybe you've noticed what, what's currently missing is sound. Um, and yes, we want to add sound to the next prototype, but this is one of the, um, the aspects that we're still kind of unsure about. Um, for, the, for the C64, for example, sound, the, the sound chip, like the glorious SID, um, the instruments were roughly modeled um, after um, analog synthesizers, and we don't, didn't really directly want to clone this. We wanted to take it a step further, but we haven't really figured out what this, what this step would be. Um, what we would really like to do is uh, explore aspects of, of generative sound, generating instruments, um, generating, generating music tracks, um, because generative programming was also big in the, in the early games, um, simply because there was not much memory. And um, yeah, this was again a technique to, to save memory. Um, for, for, the, for the interface, for the, for the player, um, 
we want to add uh, Bluetooth audio, so you can yeah, use, your, use your existing headphones if you have one. And well, since we're not Apple, you're also getting a headphone jack. Um, simply, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we, we really, really, really uh, want to try out and do this uh, games over audio in a, in a YouTube uh, video soundtrack um, kind of thing. Yeah, the, the second prototype with, with these uh, subsystems added, um, this will not, no longer be based on the dev board, but, but be uh, one big PCB with, with uh, all the ICs on it. Um, it'll come with a, or it'll be um, the first. Um, Prototype with a with a proper enclosure and uh, the mechanics for a for a D-pad. Um, yeah, like I said, Bluetooth. Um, we we'll probably want to add all the sensors that we can find. Um, mobile gaming has introduced lots of sensors to um, to games simply because smartphones usually um, yeah have a lot of sensors. And I st I'm still looking for a game idea where I can add the temperature or the air pressure to the to the way the game behaves. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of a, um, a thing for me. And um, we hope to have this, this done to, um, for the next uh, Congress, uh, the CCC Congress, but we don't really have a, have a fixed roadmap at the moment. So how do we get this design, this console, out, out to you, out to people? And yeah, like I, like I mentioned, it'll be open hardware, and um, it, we wanted it to be maker spaceable. Um, but we, we often get asked, like, OK, when, when's the crowdfunding campaign? When can I buy this? Um, to this, we usually say we're not really in or out. Um, yeah, we, we, we're not focusing on, on, on manufacturing, on serial manufacturing at the moment, um, simply because these requirements would um, sort of restrict the game design extremely, and, and either you can focus, uh, at least for a DIY product, either you can focus on manufacturability and keep the price down, which means that you're going to use all kinds of cheap Chinese bad mechanics, and it'll not really be a fun console to, to work with, um, or, the, or you could just do the design and then afterwards see how, how, much, uh, how much you can boil the design down um, to make it manufacturable and affordable. And this, the second way uh, really could work simply because uh, once you're looking at, at uh, thousands or tens of thousands of units, you get access to a whole other development platforms, and suddenly uh, a microcontroller doesn't cost like 10 or 15 euros anymore, but two or three or something. So um, while we're not aiming for this, um, a goal of going to maybe 30, 40 euros for components plus PCB at least doesn't seem out of the question. Yeah, well, what's next? Um, there's there's no, really, no real conclusion to this talk, basically because we, we just, we're, we're just getting started. We just have the, have the first um, prototype. Um, we wanted to, to do a few um, iteration with the, with the OS and the, and the hardware and see where this is going. And we're also trying to take it slow because this is really a lot of work. Halfway through the, through the year, we realized, okay, we're actually building a game console and the DIYing a game console is in no way less work. So we, we don't want to burn out. Um, and yeah, really just, just keep on going as we, as we feel like it. And um, maybe this will take another year or two or three. We don't know. But uh, we are hugely enjoying building this. And uh, we hope other, others will join and uh, yeah, work with us on this platform together. So um, yeah, this, this was mainly um, what I wanted to show you, how far we've got. Um, we invite you to keep up. Um, we'll post uh, things on, on Twitter quite often. You're in, uh, welcome to follow us. Um, we have a website. This will be relaunched. Currently, it uh, contains mainly a few pictures from the, from the development, but we'll relaunch the, the website um, and uh, put lots of articles there and release all the design files. And then, yeah, well, see where this can go. OK, I hope we have some time for questions. Um, thank yeah. you very much. Thanks, Axel. Uh, okay. It's always interesting to see uh, when an idea that took place in a gathering like this comes back as a prototype. And, um, and it makes me really happy, also, especially to see the retro game console. Um, any questions? Yeah, we have.
seem to I, have some questions. I do a, a statement and a question. Thank you for this awesome presentation. The graphics were fabulous. <laughs> Thank you very much. But this, this is all goes out to Christoph. Like, if, if it were me, you would have got latex uh, slides. How, so, but yeah, how, I'm, I'm how really happy how, myself. How many hours did he put into that presentation? All of them. <laughs> how many? I haven't, I haven't left my chair at the, at the village much this year. But yeah, <laughs> we really enjoyed that. <laughs> uh, you're using Lua as a programming language? Yeah. What about BASIC? Um, actually, the, the design is, is open enough so that you could, like, like I said, remix it. This, this is what we want. If for, if for everybody who's coming, you say, why not? I'm saying, yeah, 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 come, come on, do it. The, the interface is there. So um, yeah, the, another option would be MicroPython, I guess. Um, BASIC, there's a few other languages. We, we kept the interface intentionally clean and easy to work with. So if, you're, if your scripting engine is sort of modular and can run on a microcontroller, that you can just plug it on top of it. So uh, yeah, we're, we're open to all kinds of new languages. Amazing project and amazing presentation. I'm wondering, you, you were talking about constraints. Uh, what are you aiming in terms of memory and in terms of CPU? Right now, it seems like a super overpowered system. Yes. Um, one of the next things will be to, to uh, put a real-time OS uh, underneath it so we can really enforce this. Um, we haven't really figured this out. Uh, we Maybe something like 32 or 64 kilobytes of, of game code, like compiled game code. Um, plus game assets. Um, we, 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 at, at the moment, we just have sort of a, a, a thumb value, and then we'll just try uh, what you can do um, uh, with like, what, what kinds of games you can actually d develop at different levels. Also, also what we want to do is uh, um, have the thing remixable ourselves, meaning all the modules. Uh, should be recombinable in what we call personas of games. So you could, you could recombine them to something um, early 80s, Atari 2600 style, or something theoretical, even, even less powerful, or go early 90s, um, have uh, multiple scrolling, scrolling layers. And, and uh, yeah, so we will probably uh, develop one or two of those personas of, uh, of our own and then invite everybody else to, well, remix the console in the way that they want it. OK, thank you. Um, if, if you want to uh, see the prototype, you're welcome to come up front after the talk. And uh, we'll be at the Attractor Village um, tonight and probably to, uh, for the whole day tomorrow. So you're, you're welcome and, and try this out. And um, yeah, thank you for coming again. <laughs>